We can start. So, buongiorno a tutti. It is my great pleasure to introduce the speaker of today's colloquium, Professor Raymond Goldstein from Cambridge University. Professor Goldstein got his uh, PhD in physics from Cornell University under the supervision of Neil Ashcroft. He then held academic appointments at prestigious universities, such as the University of Chicago, Princeton University, and Arizona University. Since 2006, he moved back to Europe, where he is now professor at the University of Cambridge. He is an international recognized leader in biophysics, nonlinear physics, active matter, fluid mechanics, and so on. More simply, we can say he's a major expert in the physics of complex systems. For his studies, he received many awards and honors. Here, I just mentioned the main ones, otherwise uh, it will take me 10 more minutes to complete the list. He was elected Fellow of the American Physical Society in 2002, Fellow of the Institute of Physics 2009, Fellow of the Institute of Mathematics and these applications in 2010. Since 2013, he's also a fellow of the prestigious Royal Society. He was the recipient of an ERC Advanced Research Grant in 2010, and he got the Bachelor Prize in Fluid Mechanics in 2016. He also received from Harvard University the IG Nobel in Physics in 2012. In, the, in this colloquium, he will talk about the cytoplasmatic streaming, a fascinating flow that combines biophysics, active matter, and fluid mechanics. And we are looking forward to knowing more about this flow, which I read was discovered in 1773 by the Italian priest and botanist Bonaventura Corti. Please, we are looking forward to your presentation, Professor Goldstein. Thank you very much, Professor Mister, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen and then I'll start. Hopefully this will work. <clears throat> I hope this uh, displays correctly. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to, to be in Padua. I, I wish I could physically be there uh, and I look forward to a time in the not too distant future when I, when I can visit, um, but we'll settle for this for now. So uh, today I wanna to tell you about a problem in, a, in the general area of what we might call biological fluid dynamics. And the particular problem is, is something uh, as mentioned earlier uh, involving cytoplasmic streaming, which I will of course define for you. This is a problem that's been of interest to science, uh, as uh, Gian Paolo said, since about 250 years ago. Uh, we've been interested in it for the past 15 years or so. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see how through theory and experiment, we on the physics side can try to understand a complex problem in biology and try to make sense about how it works. And so I'm going to give you an overview today of about those 15 years of work where we've combined theory and experiment uh, to unravel a bunch of mysteries about this phenomenon. Now, the picture that I show on this first slide is of a, a beautiful aquatic plant called Cara Coralina, which is uh, uh, composed of long slender cells, like the one you see here with my cursor, about a millimeter across and several centimeters long. And cytoplasmic streaming is the persistent circulation of the fluid contents of these cells all day, every day. And I don't know about you, but uh, many years ago, I certainly had no idea of what this Uh, phenomenon was about. I learned about it from a biologist at the University of Washington when I was visiting, giving a talk in physics, and she took me aside and said, you have to learn about cytoplasmic streaming. And I, I had heard the words, but I didn't really know what it was. And since that time, I, I studied the background of it, and I realized there are a lot of really interesting physics problems buried in this biological problem. So that's what I want to tell you about today. So the place to begin, as John Paolo said, is uh, almost 250 years ago when Bonaventura Corti Uh, published uh, in Luca, which at least from my perspective seems like it's just down the road from you in Padua, but I guess it's a, probably a three hour train ride, uh, in which he announced the discovery of this wonderful phenomenon. And it was made possible by microscopes given to him by his wealthy patron that were actually made in England. 
And uh, Corti was to be the thesis advisor of the aerodynamicist Venturi. So there's a very interesting uh, story here. And uh, this book is, is hard to find, but I actually have a digital copy that I got printed out <laughs> from the British Library so I could, I could study it. Uh, and what, uh, what Corti found in, uh, in his wonderful studies was that if we look at this plant Cara, which is uh, an aquatic plant that's often put in aquaria for the entertainment of fish and is found in fresh water all around the world, uh, it has uh, little roots that anchor it to the mud and a series of cells that arch up to the surface. The whole plant can be maybe a, even a meter high. And these long slender cells, if you look at them under the microscope, are, are quite amazing. Uh, one of the things Corti did was he used, ready for this, his own urine uh, to osmotically shock uh, these cells. And then he discovered th for himself that there was this kind of sac in the middle of the, of the cell, which we now understand to be the vacuole, the, the fluid, the bag of fluid uh, contents of cells that are in, in all uh, plant cells. But the main thing that he, he showed in this depiction on the right is that the fluid was circulating all day, every day in a kind of chain-like pattern up this uh, up this organism's uh, cells from the bottom to the top. And he tried to understand what was going on. Now, um, here's a modern movie of what cytoplasmic streaming is. Uh, here we're looking at one of these Cara cells under the microscope. It's an inverted microscope, so we're looking from below. Uh, it's about a millimeter across, Never mind these bugs that are crawling around. But what you see is that uh, the fluid flow inside the cell is very stately and regular. It might be a little jittery movie, but in, 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 in real time, it's very smooth. And it flows from the left to the right, uh, above a kind of diagonal white line here, and from the right to the left below it, carrying various structures inside the cell around in a very, very smooth fashion. And this is the essence of cytoplasmic streaming, this fluid circulation. And we now understand, as I'll explain, that it's driven by molecular motors, which are nanometric protein molecules that walk along filaments that line the inside of the cell, arranged kind of parallel to this white line. And as, they, as those motors move with cargo on them that are also nanometric, they entrain fluid, and that sets the entire fluid contents of the cell in motion. And the question we're, we're basically gonna to try to answer is, is, what good is this for the cell and how does it operate from a physics perspective? Now, this phenomenon is not confined to just the one organism I showed you. It's found all throughout the animal and vegetable world. Uh, it's, it's the generic name given to the circulation of the contents of the cells. And typically for plant cells, it's the viscous cytoplasm, which is of interest. So basically there are structures that are coated with molecular motors, these proteins uh, that are walking along filaments. They're sometimes myosin uh, motors that walk along filaments called actin, or there are other motors called kinesins that walk along microtubules. But it's always this kind of railroad track-like structure with cargo being carried. The speeds can be anywhere from nanometers per second up to even 100 microns per second, which is a phenomenally fast speed at the scale of nanometric objects. And it's found everywhere. If you look in aquatic plants, like I showed you, you'll see this streaming. Uh, if you look in terrestrial plants, like the hair cells of plants or the pollen tubes of certain plants, you'll see uh, a very stately streaming. You could look in protozoa, like the organism paramecium that I show here. And in all of these situations, you often find a very regular flow. So for instance, in the aquatic plants, as I show in the bottom left, it, it takes the form of what's called uh, barber pole streaming, a kind of bi-directional helical flow along bands inside the cell. If you take an onion and cut it open and cut across an onion cell, you'll see circulation that takes the form of a very simple uh, uniform circular motion. Uh, but in these protozoa, it's often a much more disordered structure and uh, known as multi-striate streaming. So there are many different architectures that, that can be found. Uh, now, the history of this subject is, is, is both interesting and sort of amusing. Um, if you pick up uh, your trusted copy of A History of Cytology uh, by uh, uh, Arthur Hughes, uh, you can learn that, um, yes, it was discovered first uh, by Corti, at least reported first by Corti in 1774, caused much sensation, but then kind of fell off the radar of, of scientists. But then it was rediscovered in Germany in the early 1800s and, and caused a lot of activity. And then it kind of fell apart as a subject, but it wasn't until the 1950s that Japanese scientists made uh, some serious progress in understanding what was going on when they hypothesized before they understood the molecular structures involved, that this fluid motion was in some ways driven by things acting at the walls of the organism, not distributed throughout the entire organism. And since that time, there's been a tremendous amount of 
molecular biology, essentially, and understanding the players on a microscopic level. But there are a whole bunch of questions that have been left unanswered. And this is where I kind of stepped into the field and, and realized that we as physicists might be able to contribute. So I don't know how many of you have read the famous essay by J.B.S. Haldane from 1928 called On Being the Right Size. But if you haven't, I really highly recommend it. It's a kind of after dinner talk where he uses basic scaling arguments to talk about all sorts of things in, in, in biology and physics. And one of the things he pointed out was that if I think about diffusion as a phenomenon to transport material inside cells, that beyond a millimeter or so, it's a very slow process. So for instance, these uh, cells in CARA can be up to 10 centimeters long. Those are some of the largest cells known to man. And if you ask yourself for a small molecule, how long would it take to diffuse 10 centimeters? Uh, the answer is about four months. <laughs> and that's clearly too slow for anything uh, to operate biologically. And th therefore there must be other transport processes occurring and perhaps this streaming is one of them. In the late 1990s, uh, Hachachka and others pointed out that this circulation might actually play a role in maintaining what's called homeostasis, essentially by mixing up the contents of the fluid inside the cell, it would homogenize the rates of chemical reactions and perhaps allow for a better functioning of the organism. But it was the biomathematician uh, Picard who really laid out many of the key questions in this area uh, through work over about 20 years. For instance, can we visualize the things that are being transported on this apparent conveyor belt of, of molecular species? Could we list what they are? More importantly, how would they know to get on and off this conveyor belt if this really is about transport in the cell? And in particular, there's a, a more technical question, which is that many of the cells in these plants are actually connected by nanometric tubes. And perhaps the large scale transport across large numbers of these cells is, is driven by that kind of motion. So these are the kind of questions that sit over what I wanna talk about. And I'll start by just telling you how, how we've started to think about um, this uh, very simple plant, Cara, and what we can learn about it using physical techniques. So here's again, a picture of it. We're talking about an organism that's a millimeter across, maybe tens of centimeters long with these cells interrupted occasionally by branches that come off. And these individual cells, as I say, can be 10 centimeters long. If you take a more magnified view of it, you'll see this white line spiraling up here. There's another one on the other side. And a closer investigation shows that all these green material are the chloroplasts. These are the, the powerhouses of uh, photosynthetic activity in the plant. They're about 10 microns across. And this white line is basically just a missing row of these chloroplasts. So the structure of this object is basically two hemi cylinders uh, with these missing rows of chloroplasts in between them that spiral up this tube. And if you look in cross section, you discover that of, of this thousand microns across uh, the diameter of a cell, the first 10 microns or so are the viscous cytoplasm where all the metabolic activity of the plant takes place. And the vacuole is bounded by a vacuolar membrane shown in blue here, which is a lipid membrane of the kind we find all over our bodies. And the 980 other microns uh, across here is just a watery bag uh, of molecular species that are important in metabolic activity. Now, if we look uh, more closely at what's going on here, this is, this is a problem in fluid flow. It's essentially a problem in which we have these molecular motors shown the upper right here. These are nanometric structures that march along uh, actin filaments, which are polymerized uh, structures that line uh, the inside wall of this cell move uh, oriented in such a way that the motion of these motors is in one direction on one hemicylinder and the other direction on the other. And as they move and carry organelles, they drag fluid along. So this is a little bit like the problem of fluid flow in a pipe, except that instead of some pressure gradient driving the flow, essentially the walls are moving. <laughs> essentially there's a, there's a shearing action of molecular motors at the wall. And there are many, many interesting questions about this flow that one might ask, uh, and particular of the transport issues that I described to you before, but this is the basic setup. Now, just to think of it as a physicist for a moment here, um, rather than maybe giving you a biology lesson, let's talk about some of the issues of, of transport that might matter if we were to think about this, uh, this kind of cell. So we have an object, let's call it the cell of, of a size L, maybe a millimeter across, um, and there's some fluid flow associated with uh, this phenomenon. And so if we ask on the length scale L, the time to advect uh, anything, it would be L over U. 
But if there's a molecular species with a diffusion constant d, then the time scale would be L squared over d, as we know from the basic scaling of the diffusion equation. And this leads to a natural dimensionless number called the Peclé number in fluid mechanics, which is the ratio of these two time scales, ul over d. Large Peclé number means that the fluid flow dominates. Small Peclé number means that the advection dominates. And so uh, this is a bit like the Reynolds number in uh, fluid mechanics, ul over nu, where nu is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid that measures the importance of fluid transport to viscous diffusion. So if we're talking about an organism, and let's think even about microscopic organisms that are unicellular, like this little alga called Chlamydomonas, which is about 10 microns across and swims anywhere from 10 to 100 microns per second, uh, the Reynolds number for this organism is something like 10 to the minus four. So inertia matters not at all. It's completely viscous dominated. But the Peclé number can be about of order one, meaning that this organism lives in a world where the flows it creates by moving its flagella, which are these hair-like appendages that allow it to swim, are comparable uh, to the diffusive uh, fluxes in the problem. But once you get to large organisms, hundreds of microns across, like this beautiful organism called Volvox, which is uh, made of about a thousand of these chlamydomonas cells, with much faster fluid flows and a much larger scale, then the Peclé number can easily be 10 or 100 or 1,000, meaning that advection is that many times more important than diffusion. So in many ways, the transition from unicellular life to multicellular life is a transition from a diffusion-dominated world to an advection-dominated world. And that's what we're in with these organisms. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit more as a, as a, as a fluid dynamical problem. Uh, here I'm just quoting some work from Picard from 50 years ago in which uh, he imagined the simplest picture of this organism in cross-section, which is basically one half of this cylinder is set in motion at some velocity capital U and the other half at minus U. So it's like a pipe with these sliding walls. And if you're clever, you can just write down by inspection the fluid flow as a function of the radial coordinate and angle everywhere. Uh, and it's just this function. It, it depends only on the ratio of little r to the radius. Uh, and color coded here, you see that it has these two regions of very sharp transition between up and down flow. These are known to the biologists as indifferent zones. And that's just sort of the basic kind of flow you might imagine. But I, I told you actually that the, the architecture of this organism is, is actually helical, that this um, missing row of chloroplasts and indeed all the rows of chloroplasts and all the actin filaments are actually spiraling up this organism. So we thought for a while about what would the consequences be of having this kind of helical structure? And it only took us a few months to realize a very elementary fact here, which is that this organism is chiral. It's not equivalent to its mirror image. And the way you can see that, or one way you can see that is if, if I color code and vectorially code the surface of this cylinder with uh, arrows indicating the direction of the fluid flow, if I look at the projection of these arrows on the cross section, the, the perpendicular cross section here, you'll see that near this uh, uh, indifferent zone, the projections point away from the indifferent zone. And if I did the same construction on the other side, they point toward it. That's another way of saying that the object is chiral. If I look in cross section, what it means actually is that this symmetry or this chirality implies that there are cross-sectional flows perpendicular to the long axis of the cell that actually take the form of two kind of vortices. These are a little bit analogous to the vortices that might be happening just now in your aorta, that is curved pipes subject to inertial effects can actually display vortices that are called Dean vortices. But that's a finite Reynolds number effect and I'm talking about something driven uh, solely by the forcing at the wall. So there's some interesting consequences of this broken symmetry that actually produces flow perpendicular to the long axis. And one way you can see that is by just imagining a simple problem in which you have some diffusive molecule just coming into the organism uh, from everywhere around symmetrically. Uh, and we're looking at the isoconcentration lines and cross section. If there is no such flow, then of course there are circles and everything just diffuses inward in the normal way. But in the presence of this flow on the right, it will carry material across the diameter of the cell. This kind of tongue of concentration gets sent across because of those flows. And the effect is very interesting. If you actually follow a parcel of fluid over one helical wavelength of this uh, helical organism, you discover that it very likely ends up on the other side of the cell. And that is to say that its orbits looked at from above are these kind of cycloids. In other words, this is a little micro mixer. It's not a chaotic micromixer, but it's a smooth micromixer. 
Now, it's a little bit like something invented at Harvard about 20 some odd years ago called the herringbone micromixer in microfluidics, where you have microfluidic channels and you put diagonal uh, ridges in them to direct flow from one side to the other and promote mixing at low Reynolds number. That's chaotic. This is not. But the interesting thing is that while that was invented 20 years ago, Cara was invented about 500 million years ago. And, and so what you see is that nature has already found for us very clever ways to mix fluids on the micro scale. And we might learn more things about uh, transport if we study these kinds of um, plant-like um, precedents. Now, one of the questions that we had uh, when I first started working on this subject uh, many years ago was, could we actually measure the flows accurately inside these cells? Now, about two years after I moved to Cambridge in 2008, I was invited by Lynn Gladden, whose name you see at the bottom here, uh, to a seminar in Cambridge where she uh, was explaining to those who might not know the wonderful capabilities of magnetic resonance imaging techniques to measure fluid flow inside structures. So I went along to this meeting being new and I thought, well, I'll learn something. Uh, but I, you know, we're all familiar with getting MRIs of our brain or our knee, but I never imagined that you could have the resolution to actually see something on the scale of tens of microns. So I went to the seminar and I raised my hand and I said, would it be possible to measure fluid flows inside a plant with a resolution of 10 microns? And the answer was yes, if you can average long enough so that the signal to rise ratio rises to a reasonable value, and that means several hours. Well, it turns out that these CARA cells are steady on the scale of days. And so you can average all you want. So we teamed up with Andy Cederman, who runs their molecular uh, resonance imaging facility, and my then PhD student, PhD student Jan Willem van der Meen, and actually did exactly that. So you put a CARA cell in a glass tube, you have an RF coil around it in the usual way of magnetic resonance techniques, and you can measure the fluid flow by a, a standard technique where in which you impose a spin pattern, you wait a little bit and you read it out and you see how it's been transported by the fluid flow. And so down the length of the carousel shown here, there are sort of Gaussian regions of finite width that you can sample and you end up with cross-sectional flows like the three that I show you here. So it's quite amazing. You, you just measure directly the longitudinal flows of plus or minus up to 60 microns per second. You can see how it rotates with position, but we know exactly how it rotates because we know the architecture of the cell. So we can take a whole bunch of these and average them together and you get what you see on the left. This is the uh, rotationally averaged, uh, time averaged flow inside a living cell, perhaps one of the first direct measurements uh, like that. Uh, and it's an amazingly close match to the theory that comes from generalizing Picard's calculation to having helical boundary conditions. It just softens some of the features, but basically it works. And you might say, well, so what? I mean, it sort of had to work because we know that, that the, the forcing is from the edge, but there's a slight twist here. Remember, I told you that while the forcing is coming from uh, molecular motors all along the periphery, there's a membrane inside 10 microns down that is enclosing the inner contents of the cell. And, and from these pictures, there's, there's no indication that that me membrane is, is there at all. It's basically as if it's just transparent. And this led us to great confusion. Um, and in fact, I went to our plant science department here in Cambridge. I'm sort of telling this like a mystery story. I hope you appreciate that. That's kind of the way science works. You know, We follow our nose to see where we're going. So the next thing I did was I, I went to our plant science department here in Cambridge, where one of the world's experts on CARA is uh, Enid McRobbie, uh, now uh, some, somewhat lengthily retired, uh, at that time uh, met with us and, and we explained what we were interested in. And we asked her, how is it that the shear that's created at the edge of these uh, cells uh, gets through that membrane and, and moves the fluid everywhere? And she said, that's a very good question. I have no idea. I never even thought about it. And so I thought, okay, well, if she doesn't know, then probably no one knows. So let's see if we can figure this out. So at the time we had been talking to a biologist in the US named Nina Allen, who's also an expert on, on, on these organisms. And she told us of a, an amazing technique which involves exposing a, a section of the cell to a very bright light for a short period of time. And that will induce the chloroplasts that you see in green here to detach, float away, but will otherwise not damage the cell. And this allows you to have a kind of window, a transparent window inside the cell. So you can visually see what's going on. 
So we did this experiment, and this is what you see. Here's a carousel. Here's this circular region. We just took a mercury arc lamp and shined it there for tens of seconds. And then the chloroplasts all move away, except for the ones that were in the center. And you can see the fluid flow continues. And if I, if I zoom in, there it is. So this is where the indifferent zone was. And here are some dis detached chloroplasts that are just following around on the flow. So this is really good because now we can, we can see inside and, and try to make some sense about what that membrane is doing. And, and the point here is the following, as I show in the lower right, imagine that you, you turn this uh, cell a bit on its side and look down along that red line, you see at a glancing angle inside the cell. And this is what you see in this video that was taken by, by Vasily Kanzler, who was a postdoc with me at the time, an amazing experimentalist. So this is a lot of image processing, but what you see here is the membrane, this lipid membrane that's like three nanometers across that is being carried along by the fluid uh, what you see below it is the image processing remnants of the chloroplast, and above it is the vacuolar fluid. And it's kind of surfing on this flow. So this lipid membrane is not just stationary, but it's being transported. But remember that this cell is 10 centimeters long and a millimeter across. And this bag, this lipid bag is, is kind of sheared all day, every day, and yet doesn't break. So this is quite an amazing problem. And it, it leads us to wonder how is shear transmitted across a membrane? And Amazingly, just at this time, uh, there was a beautiful paper published by the group of Annie Violat at, uh, in, in Marseille, who have been interested in lipid membranes in fluids. And they, they did the following clever experiment. You take a, a lipid vesicle, so it's something like 10 or 20 or 30 microns across, but the lipid membrane is only a few nanometers. And it's a bit deflated so that there's some excess area relative to the, um, uh, the equivalent sphere. Uh, and it can be chemically induced to adhere to the bottom of a microfluidic chamber in a kind of tight way. So it's just a hemisphere. And then you flow fluid past it and you can visualize from imperfections in the membrane that it creates a kind of pair of vortices that circulate around in this membrane uh, in the direction orthogonal to the fluid flow. There's a separatrix in between. Now, the thing about this lipid membrane that's interesting is that it's like a fluid, but it's incompressible, but it's two dimensional. So it lives on the surface of this sphere, but whatever flow patterns occur on the surface of the sphere, they must be two-dimensionally divergence-free. So you can't just flow the fluid from one end to the other. You have to have some sort of recirculation. And that's what shows up, these vortices. And we thought, well, that's great. If we could do this in some really quantitative way, maybe we could learn about the viscosity of the membrane and how it transmits shear. So I set uh, to my then PhD student, Francis Woodhouse, uh, the calculational problem. Can you solve this problem? Uh, it's a hardcore problem in fluid mechanics. You have a no-slip surface, so the fluid must not move there. You've got a, let's say, nearly hemispherical lipid membrane sitting here. It's got fluid above it, fluid inside it. It's got its own viscosity, eta m, as a two-dimensional fluid. Uh, their viscosity is inside and out, find the flow everywhere, subject to some shear flow that you impose upstream. And it turns out um, the relative the issue here is how much of the viscous dissipation occurs inside the membrane versus in the fluid surrounding it. And this was a, a famous problem studied by Safran and Delbrook many years ago uh, in their study of lipid membranes. And it is conventional to define sort of dimensionless ratios of the fluid viscosity uh, of the membrane and the viscosities on either side made dimensionless with the uh, radius of the sphere. And depending on the size of these, you're in one regime or the other. So this is, a calculation I will not show you the details of, but the net result is that you can get things that look just like Violat's experiment. So these are the streamlines outside uh, such a vesicle, and these are the streamlines, the red ones inside the vesicle. And there's a series of modes, they're like spherical harmonics, of different kinds of flow fields uh, on the surface of these vesicles that are two-dimensionally incompressible. But the amazing thing is that the fluid flow inside the fluid within this sphere, hemisphere, is very strange. It, it, it peaks up at the apex, dives down to the base, comes back around in this very complicated three-dimensional pattern. So we thought, is there any way we could see this? This is a real challenge experimentally to see something like this. But fortunately, I had then in my group, uh, Aurelia Hunterkamp-Smith, who is a superb uh, lipid experimentalist. And she teamed up with uh, Francis and Vasily. She's now at the University of Lehigh in uh, the US to uh, make a microfluidic version of Violat's experiment, which you have a hemi-cylinder, a hemisphere of uh, lipid, uh, lipid vesicle. Uh, 
in a well-defined shear flow, and you can decorate the, um, the sphere, the lipids, essentially in the following way. You can make a multi-component lipid vesicle, which phase separates into uh, dense regions and dilute regions. You put a fluorescent dye in that preferentially goes into one of those, lights up to give you little domains in the membrane. And you can follow those domains in fluorescent microscopy as they move along in the membrane. So you can track what the membrane's doing. You can put in microspheres inside the fluid, outside and inside the vesicle, and you can track the flow everywhere. And this is what you see. So if you look, we're looking down with confocal imaging with our plane of focus above the top of this uh, hemisphere, you see the red lipids and you can see these little domains, dark ones going by. And the little green dots are the tracer particles in the fluid above. Then you go about 18 microns above the surface and you see a lipid vesicle in cross section here. And you can see a lot of Brownian motion, but you can get a sense there's some fluid flow going on on the inside. And when you get very close to the surface, beside the Brownian motion, you can really tell there's a kind of backflow there. So you can do a technique called particle image velocimetry in which you track these particles and generate flow fields. You generate a stack of 2D flow field. You use the fluid incompressibility to reconstruct the 3D flow from those stacks. And this is what you get. The experimental flow fields show very much the same 3D pattern that you see in the, in the theory. So this is the first uh, direct measurement of the fluid flow inside a lipid vesicle. And it seems to conform to the very simplest model, which is just a, a viscous Newtonian uh, lipid membrane uh, being carried around by the fluid. But more importantly, you could actually make a prediction, which is that if you were to measure the fluid velocity at the apex of this sphere, just as a, one metric of the flow, and scale it with the radius and the shear rate that you apply, that it should be proportional to the curvature uh, of the membrane. Uh, with an intercept, which is some universal number, 7.9 dot, 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 uh, and a slope, which gives you the viscosity of the fluid. And so we can make membranes of different viscosities. There's a very low viscosity membrane whose slope is essentially zero. We can't really measure it with any reliability. But there's a higher viscosity version of the problem, which gives us the lipid membrane viscosity pretty much in agreement with what uh, we've, people learned from other techniques. But here, as a direct measurement of fluid flow inducing forces in the membrane. And we can tell that this viscosity is sufficiently low that the membrane provides no resistance at all, really, to the shear flow. It just transmits it by moving directly with the forcing fluid in the cytoplasm. So now this leads to an interesting question, which is essentially a question in, in self-organization. Um, in other words, let's revisit what Picard calculated. He calculated the fluid flow everywhere inside this cylinder and think about the viscous dissipation that occurs when a membrane, when a fluid flows. So the rate of energy dissipation in a fluid is essentially the volume integral of the product of the viscosity and gradients of the velocity. More gradients, more dissipation. So if you color code that cross-sectional velocity that uh, Picard constructed with the, the square of the gradient, you discover these hot spots in these indifferent zones where the velocity changes very rapidly, not surprisingly. That's where most of the dissipation is. And so you might imagine in some way that maybe nature chooses the patterns of flow, perhaps to minimize dissipation or in some way make the system more efficient. And in thinking about this, we discovered a essentially unknown experiment that was lost in the depths of the scientific literature by Yatsu Yanagi in 1953. It had all of six citations or so, in which he extracted fluid from within these plant cells, squeezed it onto a microscope slide, and found an amazing process of self-organization, which we were able to repeat. And before I show you that, I want you to just think for a moment about the famous theorem that you know in topology called the poincare hopf theorem, which is that you can't comb the hair on a basketball or on your head. You have, must have a whirl somewhere, a defect somewhere. You can't have a smooth vector field on a surface of a sphere. And if you think about this, it turns out that provides a nice way of thinking about the different geometries of streaming flows that are known in nature. So if you look at long, thin tubes like pollen tubes, there's a kind of streaming flow called fountain streaming, where the flow comes up the center and goes back down the walls. And if you look at the top, that's a source type singularity. If you uh, are lucky, you can encounter reverse fountain streaming where it comes along the walls and dies back to the center, and that's a sink. Or in the onion cell that I told you about where it's circulating round and round, that means there's a center type defect at the top and bottom. These are all the topologies that you'd kind of expect from the poincare hopf theorem. And so when you do the reincarnation of uh, Yatsu Yanagi's experiment, what you see is that you end up with a bit of the vacuolar membrane enclosing like a bag of 
fluid uh, stuff from inside the cell involving chloroplasts and all the molecular motors and all of that. And if you add a bit of ATP, you can get things to move. And here initially you see it's just kind of random browning in motion, nothing spectacular happening. But if you wait a few minutes, the entire thing spontaneously rotates. It spontaneously breaks a symmetry and rotates in one direction. And in fact, if you do a little particle imaging velocimetry, you can, you can see that the early stages consisted of several of these defects, very weak, but it then decided to have just a single rotational flow with a single vortex there. And that's pretty neat. And it's a nice example of self-organization. And it led us to ask, can we understand this a bit more? So the next thing that we did with Francis was, was to make a model, a theoretical model of what's going on here. So basically when motors walk along a filament uh, and in train cargo, they, they produce forces that act on the fluid. Now, typically they, they jump randomly onto a filament uh, and walk in a unique direction to one end. And if they randomly land, but walk in a unique direction, then on average, they'll be forward of the midpoint, which means from the point of view of the fluid, the cargo is moving forward and exerting a force to the right on the fluid. But by, by Newton's third law, it, the filament must move backward and that exerts a fluid backwards. And so there's a force dipole acting on the fluid. And that is a well-known object in fluid mechanics. It's known as a stresslet as opposed to a, a stokeslet, which is the single force. So this led to the question, if you have a soup of stresslets, uh, how would they interact with each other? Could they self-organize? Uh, and so when you do this calculation, you, you discover that this problem is very much like a bacterium swimming. So here's a caricature of a bacterium swimming through a fluid superimposed on experimental results that were done by my then PhD student, Knut Drescher, in a rather heroic experiment that's a little like high energy physics. You take a suspension of bacteria and also a suspension of microspheres that are moved around as the bacterium swims through the fluid. And every once in a while, the bacterium stays in the field of view, the, the field of focus long enough that you have a, a nice track. And then you can track the fluid flow around it. Then you'll have another track somewhere else moving in another direction, you get a whole series of tracks, short tracks, different orientations of different bacteria. You rotate, translate them all together and average till the cows come home, terabytes of data. And you get this average flow field around a swimming microorganism. And it has the structure that we know is associated with the stress loop. There's flow going out the front, flow going out the back, but from incompressibility, there must be flows coming in from the side. And it's those sideways flows which will take two of these and bring them together. And that is the essence of the self-organization problem, that these stresslets will come together and form parallel bundles that reinforce and produce large-scale or ordered flows. So when you do this calculation of a bunch of stresslets using a standard kinetic theory, you discover there's a, a critical strength of these stresslets called sigma that depends on the viscosity of the fluid, the concentration that they're in, and the translational and rotational diffusion constants of the objects of interest. But the main point is that there can be, if the length scale of confinement is sufficiently small, there can be a transition to pure rotational motion where the fluid flow goes around and around and the little objects themselves form a spiral vortex as you see on the left here. And the, this angular dependence comes from the precise geometry of the angular variation of flows around uh, stresslets. So we wondered if this is true. <laughs> I mean, this is a prediction, but is, does it happen? And the point is that um, there's a ready-made system to study this. We know from, from work that we and many others did 15, 20 years ago, that if you take a bunch of bacteria at very high concentration uh, in, a, in a fluid, you can get a kind of turbulence that you see here. So this is on the scale of several hundred microns across, a thin layer of fluid on a Petri dish. The individual bacteria are a few microns across. And what you see are transient recurring vortices and jets, very much like turbulence, but the Reynolds number is zero. This is driven solely by the swimming of the organisms. So we thought maybe we could confine a bunch of bacteria and see this transition to a uh, self-organized flow. So I set this as a problem to my then PhD student, Hugo Wierland, an experimentalist, who came up with a fantastic and uniquely French solution to the problem involving food. Namely, if I take a suspension of bacteria and in water, and I add surfactant and mineral oil with which the water is not soluble, and I shake it up like salad dressing, 
I will get a, a, an emulsion in which the droplets of bacterial suspension are surrounded by lipids in a matrix of mineral oil. And mineral oil is soluble to oxygen, which allows the cells to get the oxygen they need. So you, you sandwich one of these little droplets in between two microscope slides, and then you have a confined bacterial suspension. And you discover that if the confinement is large, as you see here, in excess of 100 microns across, you have this same turbulent state that we saw before. And if you do some image processing, there's no hint of any kind of orientational order. But if you confine it in a small region, you get spontaneous circulation uh, in, a, in a rotating vortex, which could be left or right, depending on initial conditions. And indeed, there's even a hint of the spiral structure uh, to the organisms, as you see here. So indeed, there is a transition of confined active matter to spontaneous circulation. Uh, interestingly, it turns out if I go back and you watch this video, you'll see that there's a counter rotating <laughs> edge current here, which is not something that was predicted, but actually does happen. And those counter rotating edge currents do weird things. So if you confine uh, two of these little circular geometries near each other with a neck across them, you actually can get vortices that couple together either ferromagnetically or antiferromagnetically to think about spins depending upon the size of this neck. And so you can actually create a, you ready for this, a bacterial vortex lattice um, in which you microfritically create uh, arrays of posts and uh, circulating cells with necks that confine them, uh, connect them of varying sizes. And depending upon whether these currents can go through, you get either spontaneous uh, ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic coupling. And then you have a kind of statistical spin system made out of bacteria. The most important result of that is that you could actually get macroscopic flow from a system with these microscopic components. So if you make a kind of storage ring of bacteria that's small in the transverse dimension, you could make the circulating dimension meters and you still have unidirectional flow in the system. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so the last thing I wanna say in the last few minutes is, is to take you up to speed to a very recent application of these ideas to a problem in developmental biology that is really very interesting. It has to do with the development of the fruit fly, Drosophila, and in particular, the egg cells of Drosophila called the oocytes. And here's a, a confocal image from some time ago where you can visualize inside this 100 micron across uh, egg cell, there's a nucleus here, but you see this constant complicated swirling dynamics. This is a combination in green of molecular of uh, filaments called microtubules, which are the railroad tracks for motors called kinesins that walk along and entrain fluid. And what you're seeing is a perfect example of a fluid structure interaction. The motors are entraining fluid, the large scale flows deform the railroad tracks, which create new flows. So this kind of synergistic interaction is at the heart of various problems in developmental biology, because it's this stage of life where the body plan is established in the organism. So in fact, what we know from experiments um, from many groups over the years is that as you watch the development of this egg cell from a rather small uh, cell in what's called stage nine to some hours later at stage 10 and 11 when it grows, is that the disordered flows that I just showed you give way to a single rotating spiral vortex. And if you make a caricature of what the micro uh, tubules are doing here in this region of the problem. They are rather disordered in their orientation. They emanate from all around the cell, mostly from one side, but all around. But in this stage, they have been coerced to lie along the wall parallel to the wall. And in some self-consistent way, this is producing a large scale vortex. And we'd like to try to understand this. So one quick starting point is, is just a warm up problem. It takes just a minute to describe. Imagine you have an elastic filament shown in blue and you put a single molecular motor, which is walking along it from, let's say, right at the end. As it walks, it will exert a force on the fluid and there'll be a back reaction on the filament like I described before. So this filament is subject to a force at its tip. Imagine it's clamped at the origin. How do you describe its motion? Well, it's in a world of low Reynolds number of fluid mechanics. And so its velocity multiplied by an associated tensor of drag coefficients in the tangential and normal direction balances elastic forces in the problem, which turn out to be the fourth derivative of the position. And there's some kind of tension in the filament, lambda multiplying the uh, tangent vector, drds, which uh, it, is associated with the presence of this force and also the incompressibility of the system. 
But the thing about this force that's a little different than what you might imagine if you think about Euler buckling, if you can see my little filament here, if I thrust the two ends together of a filament and I buckle it, I'm pushing in a given direction. But this force always follows the direction of the filament wherever it goes. So it's called a follower force. And that changes the dynamics completely. So for instance, if you just solve a little numerical problem of the, the dynamics of this filament, you discover that depending on a single dimensionless quantity, the force I exert at the end, the length squared divided by the bending modulus of this filament, for low values of that, if I deflect the filament, it will just come back to straight because it's being straightened by its bending elasticity, which wants a straight filament. But if I crank up this force, I get to the point where there are spontaneous oscillations. It's a hop bifurcation in the standard uh, technol uh, terminology of such a transition to finite uh, frequency oscillations. And it looks a little like a flagellum. It just oscillates all day, every day, because you're injecting energy uh, by means of this force that's a follower force. And it's actually a, a kind of true phase transition in the sense that the amplitude of the oscillations grows continuously from zero. But the interesting thing about this problem is there's more to it than just that force. There's the fluid flow created by the motor acting on the fluid. And that is a point force that creates a long range flow. And if you want to see what that does, imagine as you show in the bottom that you take a filament that's bent with a bunch of motors along of it, along it, each producing flow is tangential to the filament. You're going to get a very large scale flow, which downstream from that filament will go from zero at the wall, because it's a no-slip wall, linearly upwards, a kind of shear flow. So if there's another filament over there, it will be bent. And that's the origin of essentially a new kind of instability called a swirling instability. And you can see what's going on. Imagine you have a shear flow. You have a filament. It could be an elastic filament or even just a rigid rod with a torsional spring. And whatever direction it's in, I'm going to imagine there's another copy of it upstream, just like a mean field theory in a theory of magnetism. There's a, a local force in the direction that this one is pointing. It will produce downstream of it a shear flow by the very calculation of John Blake from 1971, which says that downstream of a point force away from a no-slip surface, there's a flow that increases linearly in Z with an amplitude given by the force, the viscosity, and the distance I am from it. And so you can make a kind of self-consistent calculation, make the filament bent by the very flows produced by a bent filament. And you'll discover there's a finite threshold for a transition where everybody lies over, bent over, because they're all producing swirling flows. And when you, when you, I'll just actually skip the math on this, when you um, put this together, you discover that there is a left or counterclockwise or clockwise instability that occurs where all of the filaments bend over, create fluid flows that produce on the large scale, a single rotating vortex that self-consistently holds them where they are. Okay, so that's my whirlwind tour of cytoplasmic streaming. I've tried to show you that there are a whole bunch of really interesting problems in fluid mechanics, in biology, in transport and mixing and instabilities that all come about because of this wonderful large scale flow that was discovered not so far from you about 250 years ago. There's still many, many open questions about the significance for biology and about really making a deeply quantitative theory of these problems. But this perhaps gives you some idea of how techniques from physics can give us an entree into the area. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ray, for this beautiful, wonderful overview, very clear. And I expect uh, now there will be some questions. Uh, I ask the participants, uh, you may either ask uh, your question on the question and answer, or you may ask uh, directly by your voice. I could stop so, share. Maybe I can see people, or can I not see people? Yeah, probably. Or if uh, someone may raise uh, hands if uh, you want to ask some questions, or you can uh, write uh, your questions. And, uh, let me first start because uh, in your uh, presentation, when you see, I mean, you show this uh, beautiful microscopic uh, rotation of uh, the community of bacteria inside this uh, circular. So you showed uh, this, uh, let me see, this uh, rotation, microscopic uh, rotation. And uh, my, exactly there. So in this case, uh, 
the direction of rotation is uh, random. Does it depend on uh, the boundary conditions or it's uh, just random? Sometimes it's clockwise, some other times it's counterclockwise. Uh, as far as we know, it's completely random. Okay, uh, random. Th there, there is the possibility of a slight bias that could exist because the way that these bacteria swim is by rotating helical flagella. And there are some you know, obviously broken symmetry there uh, that can induce a particular chirality to the swimming of cells near surfaces. But as far as we know, in this particular system, that's not strong enough to make a bias. So okay. it basically randomly goes. It's a random. Right. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, everybody always asks that question. Um, okay. So, yeah, what, that what, but that's okay, it's a good question. One no, thing I should say is that, is that in, in our particular case, um, we, we can achieve these macroscopic flows provided we uh, confine in at least two of the three directions uh, on a scale that's smaller than this characteristic threshold size, uh, basically of the vortices that appear in the infinite system. Uh, there's another system very much like this of uh, microtubules and molecular motors that's studied a lot by Zvonimir Dudzik and his collaborators. It used to be at Brandeis, now at Santa Barbara. And their system has a different feature, which is that you need not confine uh, in, in the two other dimensions uh, to get a macroscopic 3D flow. You can actually get macroscopic 3D flows without such confinement. And so that's an interesting difference between the two, but but the microtubules themselves are vastly larger and obviously very different in mm -hmm. microscopic details. Yeah. Okay, so let me now read a question uh, written on. Uh, so is there any connection between a cytoplasmatic flow pattern and the cell polarization? Uh, could the person define exactly what they mean by cell polarization? Sankaran, could you either ask uh, the question by voice uh, or just type? Uh, so what do you mean by cell polarization? So to better clarify the question. Mm. So it says a protein asymmetry. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I think I know what you mean. So there are a number of circumstances in cells in which there are um, indeed protein asymmetries, maybe at one end of a cell, uh, there's an accumulation of receptors of one type or another, not homogeneously distributed. Um, so I think probably yes. Uh, so for example, um, in Cara, it is known that, uh, so these organisms live in fresh water uh, and often very um, hard water to use an English expression, meaning lots of dissolved calcium. And since they're doing photosynthesis, um, they are, uh, the products of photosynthesis are such as to change the pH around them. And that can precipitate calcium carbonate, which is basically like what you find on your kitchen faucet, right? The hard scale. And if it were kind of uniformly happening around the cell, then the cell would just be completely encrusted in calcium carbonate, which wouldn't be very good. But amazingly, the cell manages to cluster the encrustations into kind of periodic bands. And as far as I understand this, it seems as if there's some interplay between the fluid flow and the distribution of certain kinds of either ion channels or other similar uh, biological molecules in the outer membrane to produce a kind of pattern of inhomogeneities that allows for this clustering. So there can definitely be an interplay between the fluid flow and the distribution of membrane bound things. Uh, that's one example I know. Um, in, the, in the growth of pollen tubes, you also have these flows and they are thought to play a role in transporting things to the tip it's a tip-driven growth. Uh, basically, what's behind the tip has kind of solidified, but it's a bit more fluidic, let's say, in the, in the, in the growing tip. And the, the flows are helping to transport things to the end. And so that is keeping it there. So you're absolutely correct. There can be an interplay. Okay. Other questions? So at the moment, no questions. So I have another one. So in your uh, beautiful example of uh, 
this uh, lattice uh, in, uh, with bacteria. So you can tune by changing the size uh, between. Uh, so, of course, uh, you say is a nice, uh, let's say, example of uh, these uh, spin lattices uh, in uh, living matter. But uh, can you learn something more by studying these uh, living systems with respect to the classical uh, spin lattices, something, new features which well, are not unveiled? Uh, yeah, so so I think... A um, beautiful uh, analogy, I mean. Is a, yeah, so, so I mean, the, the most elementary thing you might you might wonder about. Let, let me say there are two elementary things you might. First of all, um, the only reason that all of this happens is you've got these funny edge currents where things are flowing around the boundary and kind of enforcing, or maybe it's even easier to see, it's enforcing um, the large scale flow. And, and so there's some interesting physics about these edge currents. And, and I'm deliberately using the term edge currents because in, in quantum condensed matter physics, there's a lot of discussion of things called edge currents. And these are obviously not quantum mechanical in origin, but you can ask yourself some interesting questions about whether there might in principle be in any kind of conceptual connection between these edge currents and those in terms of the topological issues involved, et cetera. So, so there is that, which isn't exactly the spin problem that you asked, but, but there actually are people who are thinking a lot about whether there are sort of topologically protected modes that could exist in active matter in analogy to uh, what you see in quantum condensed matter physics. Mm -hmm. uh, so the second thing is, if I produce one of these lattices, I'm, I, you know, the, the quote spins are, are really complicated things. It's a whole distributed lattice, sorry, it's a whole distributed uh, domain of, um, of microscopic entities that are cooperating together to produce uh, a single object we call a spin. And when you, I didn't put a video in here, but when you, when you create these lattices, you, you can see flipping transitions from counterclockwise circulation to clockwise circulation. And so you also see um, large scale patterns, which are ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, depending upon the geometry of your lattice, or even frustrated if you made a triangular lattice. But then you can ask, so what's the effective temperature in this problem? Or is there, is there one effective temperature in this problem? And where on earth would it come from? <laughs> And, and so I think actually that's, and we, we made some comments about this in, in this paper, that that becomes a really interesting problem. I mean, it wasn't what we anticipated in the beginning, but you suddenly realize that that's really interesting. You know, first of all, that I, I have more of a continuous spin than I do a discrete spin problem, but, but you know, how, what's the language to talk about it? And where do I, how do I understand this temperature? Oh, oh. Yeah. Very well. Hmm. Okay. So let me see, are there any other question? Let me see. It doesn't seem uh, there are no more questions. So it was too clear. So with, uh, what's the explanation? Right. Too complicated, explanation? yeah. No, no, I, I, I go for the, for the first one. So I guess uh, I do not see any question or no raise uh, hands. So let me thank again, uh, Professor Goldstein for this uh, beautiful presentation. And I hope to see you soon back, uh, or so actually to see you soon uh, in, uh, in Professor, uh, mm, there is one raised hand just now. Okay, let me see. So let me see, how can I? So please uh, ask the question. Because I see raised. Uh, maybe it's just uh, <laughs> maybe it's just a mistake. I'm sorry. It was somebody, uh, <laughs> somebody hit the button. Yeah, it changed the idea. <laughs> okay, so let's thank again uh, Professor Goldstein, and I hope to see you soon in uh, in Padua for some uh, live lectures. Thank you so much for the invitation. I have enjoyed this very much. Thank you very much. Okay. See you. See you. Okay, so I guess we can stop. Uh... Okay.